Agnostis, which gives its name to the larger group, the Agnostids, lived from the middle to the late Cambrian of a few different places. And it was initially thought to have lived globally, but later that was actually reduced as people started to realize some of these other fossils weren't actually Agnostis. However, that does help to show that even very early on, they were very widespread and successful as a group. The Middle to Late Cambrian is also really well known for being not just when the Agnostids started to diversify and start to get around the entire world, but when a lot of other groups did, including other groups of arthropods, as well as things like worms and even chordates, which would lead to the vertebrates like us. This event is normally known as the Cambrian Explosion. Now, there is still a lot that we do need to understand about them to really get a better sense of how they were living. And they were still very successful for a time. Like I said, they as a group got around globally, at least until the end Ordovician mass extinction where they disappear from the fossil record, which means they were still around for at least a few tens of millions of years. This extinction was probably caused by a few different events, including glaciers forming on the southernmost parts of the continents that were starting to get more conjoined at that time. This would have then lowered and taken water out of the seas, which would lower the amount of continental shelf that different organisms living in different parts of the environment would have had to live. There are also a few other environmental disturbances that would have changed water chemistry and that also could have had an effect. It was a devastating extinction and this is just one of the groups that did go extinct then. As for they themselves, they weren't exactly massive. Most are, at the largest, a few millimeters in length, and there's none really that much larger than that. So they were not big animals. They were, in fact, very, very small. And that helps us to understand at least potentially how they might have been living, because most of them at least have no eyes. And that means they probably weren't swimming around the water column trying to chase after things. It's not really that useful to swim very far if you can't see where you're going. Not having eyes, though, isn't that strange for the one group that they look the most like at a surface level glance, and that's the trilobites. Trilobites are so named because they essentially have three lobes on their cephalon, the head portion, where you have the globella in the middle and then the two lateral lobes, and that same pattern kind of holds down as you go down the body all the way through the thorax and then follows all the way down through the pygidium. Trilobites in general experimented with a lot of different body shapes, although that's not quite as true of things like Agnostis. And that's because Agnostis and the other Agnostids are pretty much all isopygous, meaning the size of the head is basically the same size as the size of the tail. So those two pieces can fit together really nicely, especially if the animal was able to roll up, which some studies have been able to show that, yeah, these organisms could roll up pretty well and protect themselves in that way. The strangest part about that in Agnostis, though, is that unlike almost every single other trilobite, it only had two thorax segments. And that actually holds throughout the Agnostids. They really didn't develop very many thorax segments. They basically just had big head shield, big tail shield, and a little bit of body segments. It's kind of strange to actually see in the fossil record that these organisms were very, very different, even from what's presumably their close relatives in the trilobites. With all that said, there's still over 20,000 named species of trilobites, so it's not entirely strange that some of them might have started experimenting. In fact, there's some trinucleid trilobites that actually did experiment with smaller numbers of thoracic segments. But that still brings us to another question, which is, what did the trilobites do? And the answer is almost everything. I hate to be that vague, but they did a lot of things. There were some, like fake ops, that were active predators. There were others, like some of those trinucleids and the harpedids, that seemingly had large, flat head shields that were used to help shovel up different amounts of dirt so they could feed on things in that dirt. They had a lot of different behaviors and did different things. As for things like Agnostis, it seems like they were detritivores, meaning essentially just sitting at the bottom of the ocean and hanging out, eating whatever kind of marine snow or debris kind of just washed down to the bottom and just munching on that. In fact, there's some other trilobite groups that do resemble the Agnostids. For example, losing their eyes and also losing some amounts of their facial sutures. The facial sutures are essentially little creases in parts of the cephalon where the animal would be able to break apart its cephalon. And while that seems counterintuitive, these animals need to shed to grow, or at least needed to. And that means when they were able to pop that off, they could escape and then enlarge and grow a new, harder carapace again. However, there are a few trilobites, mostly those that seemed like they were living very much on the bottom and kind of detritivores, that also lose eyes and lose those facial sutures. So it's not incredibly isolated that the agnostids are doing this kind of strange thing. There are others that did, they just also weren't maybe five millimeters long. So they're still doing something weird, but at least it's something that is similar to some other trilobites. 
While this all seems like great evidence that they were for sure trilobites, there's still other organisms they at least somewhat resemble. Namely, in this case, the ostracods, which are actually the first branching group of crustaceans. They have two valved shells, and kind of like the cephalon and pygidium in agnosis, they can close them to protect themselves. However, rather than having it be parallel to the way the body would run, in the ostracods it's actually perpendicular, so there's some differences that still exist. However, there are still more that does seem kind of similar. For example, some of the structures on the legs of things like agnostis help to suggest that they were kind of like those that we do find in crustaceans. They weren't quite as complex as you see in other trilobites. They also potentially were living in a similar manner to many early ostracods. Ostracods also have a great fossil record, and by that I mean there's some places in Ordovician rocks where they make up almost entire layers of rocks. And there's a few places where Agnostis, specifically Agnostis pisiformis, does the same thing, and that means you can look at a bunch of them. And some of these were really well preserved, so well preserved that the researchers could look at their entire growth series, and what they found is a number of different things that are traits that it has that most trilobites don't have. First off, with those legs, it is possible that Agnostis may have still needed to clear the seafloor when large predatory worms were moving through the seafloor. It would have been a way to escape, and they wouldn't need to know where they're going that much. It would essentially just be a, all right, we're just going to go a little bit and then hopefully crash down somewhere where I'm not going to get eaten. And that is a thing we do see in some modern species, like crinoids today. They don't have eyes, but at least some feather stars can move through the water column to avoid being eaten. This also means that if the idea that they're very early crustaceans or very closely related to the crustaceans is correct, potentially this kind of leg shape was just exapted. Essentially, it evolved for just a little bit of swimming on the water and then was adopted and slightly modified to help certain types of larvae and even ostracods swim even better. And that could be the reason their legs aren't built exactly the same way as other trilobites. There's also the antennules, which are kind of a second pair of antenna, which connect into circular sockets very similar to what we see in ostracods. So it does make some sense that potentially they were moving there. There's also some stuff in this paper about their mouth parts being more similar to those in ostracods. However, that may also just be because they're very small sized. And that gets into a lot of jargon, and I am not an arthropod expert, so I will leave that to the experts to discuss. But again, it seems like it's more like those in ostracods rather than what we see in trilobites. There's also some little grooves on parts of the carapace that seem to resemble those that we do see in some species of ostracods. And this is also very important potentially, because it seems like these kind of adaptations are able to help the animal actually improve its ability to take up oxygen from the water, essentially to help it breathe. What this potentially means is that this is a common feature that evolved in the ancestor to both things like agnostis and the ostracods. And then later, as certain types of crustaceans got larger, they lost some of that. It wasn't as necessary because they had more surface area and could take in more oxygen more easily. So there's evidence that the agnostids weren't actually trilobites, but potentially crustaceans are very closely related to them. The biggest thing to consider, though, is also that they were very small and very unique for whatever they were. Some of the trilobites necessarily weren't doing the same thing because they were larger. And there's actually a chance that they could have just been more pedomorphic versions of the trilobites. Pedomorphic here meaning essentially just retains juvenile characteristics into adulthood. And from what we know of young and small trilobites, they aren't that dissimilar from things like agnostis and the other agnostids. This includes having fewer segments in the thorax, but also things like not having really pronounced eyes and not having facial sutures. From what we know of larva trilobite, they also didn't have those, so potentially they just retain those characteristics into their adulthood, and that's why they are the way they are. They're still trilobites, just weird ones. One of the really cool things researchers could do, though, to help test this is they could actually look at genetics of ostracods and specifically experiment with them and potentially see if you could get that kind of change where instead of running perpendicular to the body, you can get the two valves to run parallel to the body. If there is a genetic signal that actually helps to address this, could be really strong evidence that the agnostids are some of the first crustaceans, or again, closely related. Now, it's been over 500 million years since these groups would have split, so those genes may not even exist anymore. It's hard to say for sure. However, you could potentially look at some other organisms that still have longer bodies as crustaceans, things like lobsters or even crabs where they tuck under part of that body, and compare that to the genes that are in ostracodes and try and understand if there is some sort of genetic signal that can change the shape of those shells. The good thing about the trilobites, including Pegetia, which is actually here on, on the shirt for Trilobites of Utah, uh, 
The good thing about all of those organisms is there's being updates made to the Treatise of Invertebrate Paleontology. This is a great tool for understanding paleontology because it tries to essentially document every single species of invertebrate that we know of in the fossil record. And that means that there's oftentimes many, many volumes that document even just a single group. So it'll be really helpful as people continue doing research for the treatise on invertebrate paleontology. And I know there's some people that have already studied horseshoe crabs for this and gone, hey, this one species, it's actually a bunch of species. And so things like that will help us really understand not just how diverse they were, but what they were. And so with any luck, people eventually start looking on things like agnostis, but also the trilobites and the early ostracods. And then maybe we can figure out what the hell is agnostis. So how about you, the viewer? Do you believe that they were trilobites? Or are you still just a little bit agnostic about it?